It is a joy to have David um, Bailey with us. As you all know, um, David and Cheryl and the boys moved down to Ballina, um, and they're planting the church down there, and they're joining in with what God is doing. We miss them about here, <laughs> do we do? Um, but we're thankful for them following God's call and plan. Um, uh, come on up, David. Um, at, a, at a later date, um, we, we'll get you a full update, because I know lots of you will want to know what's, what's going on and what's happening. Um, and even afterwards, feel free to grab, grab Dave and sort of find out. Um, and if you want the truth, ask the boys. They're floating around as well. Um, ask, Seth. ask Seth. He'll tell you all knowledge. Yeah. Um, but uh, the, the point of our, our, our Proclaim series has been to talk about people's journey with Jesus and where that journey started and how that happened. Um, and maybe you're in this room um, this morning. Maybe someone's invited you along and you're like, going, oh, why am I here? Can I ask you at this bit, just tune in and hear of what God has done in someone's life and changing and transforming it um, and to know what he can do for you. And I think the thing that I love about God is that we can be sitting in a crowded room like this, lots of people different things going on in their heads, different things, but God becomes extremely personal and he knows what's going on in your life at this moment and wants to draw near and speak into that. Um, basically, I'm here to kick him whenever he goes over his time. That's the only reason I'm here. Um, so I'm going to let him go for it. And Dave, it's great having yeah, you with us. Thank you, Rick. Uh, yes, so look, I have been, I have a long journey of following God. Uh, you know, I've been walking with the Lord for 20 odd years now. And... Uh, I could tell you of stories of miracles, of provision. I could tell you how Cheryl and myself got together. That is a miracle story in itself. Uh, no, it really is. It's super. Uh, but I suppose that to go away back where, where the journey began for me, like that is the biggest miracle so far, like that, that Jesus found me and he rescued me and he, he brought me into his family. Um, so for me, look, where it all started was uh, I had a great upbringing, loved the outdoors, and had a great family. You know, I could sum it up like that. My family were brilliant. Uh, and then where it all sort of to unwind, should we say, was when I turned 15. And, you know, any of you guys know that when you have a 15-year-old, um, you know, that's all I'm going to say. You have a 15-year-old and <laughs> things are the way they are. And I was the way I was, but in the middle of all that, so at 15, my mum and dad sat me down and they said, look, we're, we're going to separate and, uh, you know, you're going to be here and your sister's going with your, your dad. And for me, that's where everything just started to unwind. And that was a real shock to the system for me. And actually just sitting at that table and hearing that news, it was a trauma for me. And then from sort of from that day on, I, I can remember just spending some time on my own that day and just saying to myself, well, stuff them sort of thing. If they don't care about me, I'm not going to care about myself. And that, that sounds harsh, but I suppose that's where I was at. And it wasn't my mum and dad's fault. You know, we are all human. We've all got mess. If someone's to look at my life, I'm sure they'd find something. Uh, but, and, you know, so there was stuff going on there that caused them to make that decision which then had uh, you know ripple effects on down through our family and for me I was I'm a passionate person I like to do things well so and I like to go for it so that day I made a conscious decision and I said you know what I'm gonna go buck mad I'm gonna go bonkers I'm gonna unwind I'm gonna block out all this pain and I'm just gonna go headlong into the world and wh that's what I did and um, I was very impressionable you know, a 15-year-old lad um, that just wanted to be loved. You know, that's what, what we all want. We want family, we want care, we want love. And so uh, I just, I had a big group of friends, about 15 of us, I think there was. And I was the wee baby. I was the youngest one. They were all older than me. They were all wiser than me. And, uh, they, you know, they had more experience in life than I had, obviously. So, but where I sort of, pitched my life was like, you know, I need to, I need those guys to see me. I need them to know that I am radical, like that I am mad, that I, I am all out for this. 
And so what started was this five years of just unwinding of drugs and alcohol and all sorts of stuff which led to violence, which led to, you know, I could tell you a hundred different stories of where I ended up and who I was with and what happened. But I suppose, you know, just maybe to give you a couple of clues of where I was, was like, you know, when you go into that world, it's just a plummet, you know, the drugs got a hold of me. Uh, the, I wouldn't say I was addicted to drugs. I would say I was addicted to uh, just getting away from myself and hiding. And that was an addiction in itself where I just wanted to be away from myself. Uh, I spent a lot of time in nightclubs and parties and, you know, had Monday-itis every week and Tuesday-itis and Wednesday-itis, didn't go to work and all this sort of stuff. Um, but, you know, I ended up doing crazy stuff like driving through, always on drugs, driving the car and driving too fast, lots of people in the car, you know, doing crazy stuff. Like, I should have been dead, like, I'm sure, 10, 15 times at least in some of the things that I was doing, just in the car alone, um, you know, was very, very dangerous. Like, uh, I can remember one time, there was one friend of mine who was really, like, there was two of them, really, and one of them was really, he sort of looked after me. Uh, so he knew I was on a bender and he, he sort of was looking after me. And one day we were um, driving down the motorway towards Belfast and I had taken some drugs in Dromore and jumped in the car and there was about 13 of us in a Renault 19. That in itself was creative, let me tell you. Uh, and we went, we were heading towards Belfast and we were going down to do some stuff and then right about Macro where the bridge is there, I could feel myself just like getting high basically and the car started to drift off the road and head towards that bridge and I was going to go smashing over the bridge and, the, and this guy just sort of woke up and grabbed the steering wheel and the car flew back onto the middle of the road and you know I was safe and uh, there was a couple of times actually that the, the, the same guy did the same thing nearly ran into cars, nearly, you know, killed everyone in the car and who knows what else pain I could have caused other people. But, you know, you don't think about that at the time. You, you're just getting away from yourself and you're trying to run from yourself. And um, for me, how, how the Lord caught up with me is really interesting because whenever I was growing up, I would have went to my mom and dad would have sent me, you know, there's the five-day Bible club at the Brethren. There's the five-day Bible club at the, the free peace. You can go to the Methodist. Everyone had a five-day Bible club. I don't know what it was, but I ended up going to all of them. And uh, I won the Bibles. I won all the sweets. I got all the memory verses, you know. And uh, that stuck with me because whenever then I was going through this stage of unwinding and, like, to be honest, it just was depressive and heavy uh, you know, I was hearing lots of voices in my head of paranoia. I had this swirl of like this narrative going on in my head all the time. And so how the Lord caught up was, with me was that I, I sort of, I remember sitting in my room one time and I sat down and I was like, my head is fried. Like I felt that my friends were all behind my back saying stuff and there was lots of stuff going on to the point where I just I was getting really heavy and lonely and I, I sat down on my bed and says to myself right where's that bible that you know that wee bible but you know the ones with the pictures on it where they're fishing for for fish and uh, it's all colorful and I go poking into my mom's room and I'm looking in her drawers and I'm looking in this box and that box and I find this wee bible and so I'm, I'm really at my wit's end at this stage and, I, and I, I'm desperate. And so I sit on the edge of my bed and I just say, um, okay, God, you know, I thought this was a, this magic book that you'd done something and something jumped out. And some people treat it like that, but uh, that particular day I did and it worked. <laughs> it was the only day it ever did. Uh, so I just sat on the edge of my bed and I was like, God, you, you know, you know where I'm at, like, I need to meet you here, you know, and I opens the Bible just randomly, like, 
opens the Bible and I see at the top of this the heading of like King or First Samuel or Psalms or something, and it just said, David craves God's help. And I smacked the Bible closed. It freaked me out. And I went into like three more months of, you know, wildness just to ignore the reality of what I thought and seen. And then uh, right in the middle of all this, I didn't say this in the last uh, service, but I sort of remembered Neil Guinea was a pain in my backside. <laughs> I worked with Neil Guinea. I was a tree surgeon. Imagine letting me loose up your trees. <laughs> My goodness, uh, and it was it was a bit like that to be honest. But uh, Neil Guinea was so we all had a like a wee team, and I was in this Land Rover, and there was a team of guys cutting trees all over the country. And Neil Guinea pestered me. He had the, you know the wee chick publications and the wee old tracks with the wee pictures. And this I can remember once burned into my mind of it looked like the the scene of hell. And my goodness. I can remember, he used to say to me, there you go, Davy, you read them wee tracks there, Jesus loves you, mate. And I was like, ah, go away, Neil, will you give me a headpiece? And I says, I'm telling you, Neil, I'll take them, but I'm not reading them. But years and years later, I still had those wee tracks all, like, stapled, joined together, loads of them. And I was reading these things, you know, and saying to Neil, like, you know, Neil, I'm, yeah, I'm doing my own thing. And when Neil left that job, I can remember just um, thinking, I need, I need to meet God. I need to get saved. I need to start reading my Bible. And, you know, all this stuff was going into my head to the point where I started moving jobs. Like thinking, right, if I move this job and I become a Christian and I tell these people that I'm a Christian, then they won't ask any questions. I done that like a couple of times. And uh, I just remembered, you know, halfway through the other uh, time there. And this, the Lord was like hounding me, you know. I had this other wee man called Robert from the, the Lifeboat Missions, actually. Worked with him in Jeff Wilson's yard. And he was so nice, you couldn't say no to him. And he says, David, would you like a wee tape? We'll have a wee preacher here. And uh, he would have came up to me and he was so friendly. And I took them and I listened to those tapes over and over and over. And I knew what the conviction of the Holy Spirit was because it was just in me. Like, I was like, ah, like, I just knew I needed to meet the Lord. And in the middle of all this and the depression and the, the, the madness of my head that was this swirl of lies from the enemy, you know, I had seen lots of stuff. I'd seen lots of darkness that had been in lots of places in Belfast, in clubs, in houses, in estates, situations that I wouldn't want any of my children to be in. I'd seen demonic stuff. I'd felt demonic stuff. I knew all about it. And, you know, it had become a part of my life, right? And so when it came to, like, me pursuing God and going after God, uh, little did I know he was, he was the one hounding me. So uh, I, I got up one morning, right, and... It was like this clarity and I can remember like going, I need to go to church today. And so I had a wee think to myself and I remember this wee woman, she was a dental hygienist uh, and she must have done her own teeth because she was always smiling. <laughs> and uh, I just remember where, did, where, you know, she was walking from church in the Elam and Dremore to her house and every Sunday I'd just seen this wee woman walking and she was smiling like she was just smiling really bright. And I always, I must have clocked it in my head and logged it because that morning I woke up and I thought, I'm going there. I'm going to the Elam because she smiles and I need to smile because <laughs> my head was not smiling. And uh, so I get up, I go to the Elam church and it was amazing and the worship was phenomenal. And I felt myself like, wow, this is like another level of life that I, I haven't found yet. And so I, I sort of slips out. I go back, process that week, like, oh, next week I go back anyway. And I come back next week and um, the chief superintendent, uh, just sounds very important, but of the Elam Church, uh, John Glass was speaking and he preached and I never heard him. 
because I was in this swirl of like a lostness, a narrative in my head and sitting there. And then he, he just said this at the end of the service. He said, we're going to spend five minutes and we're going to invite the, the Holy Spirit to speak to people. So just be quiet. And like for five minutes, I was trying to avoid all noise in, in, or all silence in my, in my life because I just wanted noise in my head to forget what was going on. But in those five minutes, uh, the Lord just started to, I felt convicted. I can remember I had a Lucasade bottle and I think it nearly become part of my hand. By the end, I was like slowly squeezing it. And then I said to the Lord in, in that minute, I just said, God, I said, I don't even know if you're real. Like, you know, I'm sitting there at the back, no one knows me. And this man at the front, he just says, there's a young man in here at 19, like I was nearly 20, he says at 19, has just says to God that he doesn't even know if he's real. And he says, that guy, you just need to come to Jesus. So at that minute in time, I had all this narrative going, oh my goodness, this is real. God's speaking. Like, and then I had this choice to make. What, what am I going to do? Because... It's so real now. And what about my family? What about all my friends? How am I going to deal with all this? And I got to the point where I just made a decision and I just was like, okay, God, I need you to change my life. Like, I can't do this. This is a mess. Will you change my life? And I says, I'm sorry. Will you just change my life? And at that minute, I literally actually felt two hands coming off my shoulders. I felt them lifting and I felt something leaving my lungs. And I felt like, whoa, I took a breath like I had never taken before. And he shouts out, you know, this young man is just giving his life to Jesus. And so I'm like, how does this guy know this stuff? Like, <laughs> like what is he? You know, and so I goes and speaks to him afterwards. And, uh, you know, I was like, that was me. And I started to tell him my story and he starts to pray for me. And... You know, that, that's where my journey began with Jesus. And to be honest, it has been, like I've seen a lot of miraculous provision from God. I have seen, like how God provided Cheryl for me as a wife has been miraculous. But in all those years of growth from that point, that was the seed point, And it was the growth from there, you know, where I, you know, it was tough at work coming back and saying, hey, I'm a Christian now. And they were like, I weighs up. And getting the abuse and getting the stuff thrown at you. And if you said something, then they said, oh, you lied there. And I probably did, but, uh, you know, I, I just was wired to lying. But bit by bit, the Lord started to open up my heart. And I used to just come home from work, get on my knees, leave the lunch bag there on the knees, one hour, one hour or so just praying, God help me, like I, you told me you would help me and this is really difficult. So that was my first sort of five, six years, just crying to the Lord, help. And uh, he did, you know, and, and sitting at night with the KJV in the dictionary, trying to work out what the Bible meant, you know, uh, and growing uh, and just having people around me, you know, to, to mentor me, to help me grow. Cheryl was the bossy voice that said, no, David, this narrative in your head is stopping, you know, because even though I was saved and delivered, the enemy will come back. And he tries to say, you're, you're mine. But actually, see, through the word, through prayer, and through Cheryl being bossy with the... <laughs> You know, in the best possible way, just saying, no, David, and, you know, prayed for me one night, and about five years later, you know, into my journey, the narrative stopped, you know. So, look, I could tell you a load of stories about how I got to where I am now, like, ask me and I'll tell you, but that's how I got to know Jesus, you know. Can we say thank you to David, please? And it, in all of these stories, the feedback we've been getting is, um, and what happened next? <laughs> what, what is the journey? So please do feel free um, to come and, and talk to David um, about some of that um, journey um, after that, of that moment of what God has done in his life and 
we'll look forward to getting updated about everything that's happening with you guys in, in Ballina. But I suppose it's to go, this can be your story. In this place, this can be your story of God grabbing hold of your life and of turning things around that seemed impossible to turn around. Um, and we would love you. Gerald is going to come up and share God's word as we listen and we lean in and go uh, almost here, hear from, from, from God's word, the truth of what he wants to bring into our lives. So Gerald, we welcome you, you up to, to share with us. to um, be sharing even this moment with, with um, Gerald of, he's been a key encourager in my life um, right through even my early stages of, of ministry um, and also in, many of you know, of reach mentoring, of helping us get that set up in the early days and starting it. So um, Gerald, we really appreciate um, your consistent faithful witness in this time. Um, and what you have lent into over many years. I'm so appreciative. Yes, thank you, Rick. And uh, it's nice to be with you indeed. But look, we've just heard an amazing story. And I was listening again to David. That's <clears throat> a confirmation, really, of what we've just been singing. Our God is mighty to save. Amen. And over this last six weeks, we've been hearing stories just like that. Uh, of people whose lives have been radically changed by the grace and the power of God. And uh, maybe, yes, in a few weeks or whatever, we'll hear about the work in Balana, what God's doing through David there. And uh, You know, evangelism is a wonderful thing. We like to evangelize. But we've got to tweak it again and again. Can't always do it the same. The situation is different. Our approach has to differ. The message, it'll be the same. The methods will change. And if we don't change the methods, we become less effective. There was a street preacher in Belfast who became aware of that. You know, it's like they stand at the, the streets there of Royal Avenue, maybe in around by Corn Market. And they're preaching, the people are passing by, but the people are too busy. They're hurrying to the next shop. And he realized that the people were so busy, they weren't hearing what he wanted to say. So he changed his method. And what he did was this. When he noticed that there were people coming along and they were going to be passing by, he took his jacket, his coat off. He set his coat down on the ground. And then he began to, to walk around the coat. Very slowly, he just walked around his coat. And then as he was walking around, he kept staring at his coat. And then when he realized that there were people sort of saying, what's happening here? He then started to speak out loudly. It's alive. It's, it's, a, it's alive. It's under my coat. It's, it's under my coat and it's alive. Now, curiosity was definitely getting the better of the people. When he saw that moment, he slipped his hand uh, under his jacket, under his coat, and he lifted out. He lifted out his Bible. And he says, it says in this book, but the word of God is living and powerful. And so it is, he said, because this book has a message that has changed my life. And then he went on briefly to tell of God's love, God's power, forgiveness, and acceptance. You see, that's what we've been hearing this now, the sixth week. That God's love and power changes lives, radically changes lives. As I've been thinking of this particular Sunday, that one verse came to my mind that I believe describes the lives of all the people who have been here on this platform for six weeks, over those six weeks. And it's a verse that I want to take as our key verse this morning. Galatians 2.20. Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith in God, simply trusting in God, who loved me and gave himself for me. 
What a declaration. To stand up and say, Christ is living in me. That's what David was saying there. That moment his life changed. Christ came to live in him. And the life that I now am living, I'm living it by faith. That's simply trusting in the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. Recently, I read a book entitled Ending to the End of All Wars. It tells of incidents that happened during the Second World War when many thousands, in fact, of uh, British soldiers were captured by the Japanese, forced to build that, what we know as the Death Railway, through the jungle of Burma and Thailand. Many soldiers lost their lives. Their 18,000 POWs died. It was there that an amazing incident took place one evening. It was at the end of the day, at the end of the day when all the tools that they'd been using had to be handed back. They handed all the tools back and as they were standing in line, waiting, waiting for the count to be made, the count was made but an officer, he then goes into an absolute anger and he shouts out to the soldiers who were standing there, one of the tools is missing. One of the tools is missing. Whoever has taken and hidden that tool must step forward. Nobody moves. Nobody moves. And then he, he got into a greater rage and anger and he shouted at all the soldiers, look, he says, if the man who has taken this particular tool that was a spade if he has not taken, if you have taken this spirit, you step forward. If you don't, everybody's going to be punished. Everybody's going to be punished. And then one of the soldiers, the Argyle Southern Highlanders, stepped out of the ranks, stood to attention and said, it was me. It was me. The Japanese officer, in front of all his fellow comrades, beat him to death. And marched the rest of the troops back to the camp. Had to count the tools again. Again they stand in line. And they're standing in line, waiting. It was at that moment that the Japanese realized, we've made a terrible mistake. At the first count, no tools were missing. There was no spade taken. And that soldier who went forward that day knew that. And yet he willingly stepped out of line and he gave his life. Now why did he do it? Why did he do it? Simply for this one reason. He gave his life save the lives of others. That's why. And I've been thinking if I had been there that day, if I had been standing in the ranks, if I had been one of those soldiers waiting, and this comrade stepped out, a friend who I knew, and he has just given his life for me, how would I have reacted? How would I have felt? How could I describe my feelings? What words would I say? I ask you this morning, if you had been in the ranks, and the soldier laid down his life for you, where do you feel? What words would you use? I, I think, I think I would say words like, I'm, a, "I'm so thankful, I'm so grateful, I'll never forget him. Look what he's done for me." Just think for a moment what you might have said. Hold on to the phrase. Just hold on to the phrase. Because we'll come back to it in a moment or two. I want to go into another story. I want to go into a second story. And again, it's a similar kind of story. It's a story about another person. Another person who gave his life to save others. In fact, this person, this person gave his life to save you. He gave his life to save you. 
There's a verse in the Bible that goes like this. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Just eight words. Absolutely amazing and absolutely true. He gave his life for us. I wonder this morning, is that something that's really touched our heart? What did it mean for Jesus to lay down his life? We all have favorite hymns and we have favorite songs. Certainly on my list at the top sits when I survey the wondrous cross in which the Prince of Glory died. Isaac Watts wrote it over 300 years ago. And if you go home and pick up your dictionary, look up that little word, survey. Survey, when I survey the wondrous cross, survey. What does that mean? What does it mean? It means to stop, to pause, to closely examine, carefully look at. And Isaac Watts wanted us to stop. He wants us to pause and think. Closely look at, carefully examine what? The wondrous cross. I'd like to do that just for a few minutes. Because that's where Jesus gave his life for us. And I know whilst I, I go through maybe certain scenes and events, these will be so familiar to you. They'll be really familiar. But I would pray this morning that the, the passion, the love of Calvary would touch all our hearts. These words and scenes are real. This is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And this is how he gave his life for us. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus knew exactly what it was that, that lay before him. He knew about the cross. It didn't surprise him. He knew about the cross. He knelt and he prayed in agony, his blood dropping to the ground, uh, sorry, his, his sweat dropping to the ground like great drops of blood. An angel comes to strengthen him. And as he knelt in agony in the garden of Gethsemane, whilst he could have called upon thousands of angels to come and rescue him, he was silent. He was silent. He didn't run out of Gethsemane. He didn't hide in Gethsemane. And when the soldiers came forward, he actually, it says in John's Gospel, that he stepped forward. He allowed those soldiers to bind. He didn't fight against them. They took him away that night, and throughout that night he was in various trials. And put into the custody of the soldiers. Their business was simply this, guard them, keep them, keep them safe. Pilate will decide what we're going to do. But unfortunately, the soldiers didn't just do that. They physically beat him. They embedded into his brow a crown of thorns. They threw a purple robe over him and mocked him as a king and spat on his face. He was treated horribly. The Pilate gave a command that he should be whipped. Whipped. The leather strands of that whip were tipped with, with lead and with bone. And the purpose was simple. They were tearing the very flesh off his back. And here is the Son of God. You know, I often feel too often the, the cross of Jesus Christ is sanitized. You see artist impressions, you see films, you see pictures, and, and you see Jesus at the cross and he's barely marked. I'll assure you, he was marked. Isaiah 52, 14. His appearance was so disfigured he did not look like a man. 
and his form did not resemble a human being. That's how badly he had been treated. And they brought him to Calvary, a little hill outside the city walls. And they put him through the most painful form of execution, crucifixion. You know, I say it again, Jesus did never retaliate. I really do believe in my heart that when they brought him outside of Jerusalem, and they, they, they put that wooden cross on the ground, and Jesus is laid upon the cross. I believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, outstretched his arms himself and opened the very palms of his hands. And he permitted those Roman soldiers to drive the nails through his hands and his feet and fix them to that cross. He was a lamb led to the slaughter, he was silent. And then he was lifted up to die. He heaves for, for the very next breath in his body. This is how he gave his life for us. And then an absolutely amazing thing happened. Amazing. Never before. The God of creation in Genesis 1 said, let there be light. But the God at Calvary said, let there be no light. And for three hours from 12 midday to 3 o'clock, the whole land is covered in darkness. Why? Why? Because in those three hours, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has become the Lamb of God. And he's making a sacrifice for our sins. All of my sins, every single one of my sins was laid upon him. He took responsibility for every sin I've committed or will commit. And every sin laid upon him, he then took the punishment for them all. And in those three dark hours at the cross, he cried out to his own father, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yes, God, the father whom he enjoyed intimacy with all his days, never before for a moment was that fellowship ever broken. It was broken at Calvary. And it was broken for me. He gave his life for me. He went through the cross for me. He endured that moment of being forsaken. It says in Isaiah 53, 5, that not only was he wounded, wounded for my transgression, but he was crushed. He was crushed for my iniquities. Crushed. I, I've struggled with that. I'm going to be honest with you. I have struggled with that this week as to how can I adequately express any words to explain those three simple words. He was crushed. I have no words to give you. I cannot explain the intense suffering, the pain, and the agony in the darkness alone on the cross that Jesus Christ endured when my sin were laid on him God crushed him he paid the price he laid down his life think back again just to that moment that the jungle of Burma where that soldier laid down his life. What words came to your mind? How would you have responded? Thankful? Yeah. Never forget him? Yeah. Now, let's move into another scene. and Stand at the foot of the cross. And this is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Despised, rejected, mocked, spat upon. Crown of thorns embedded into his head, his back torn to shreds, nailed to a cross, forsaken by the Father, and crushed. What words do you give to respond to his sacrifice for you? How do you respond? What do you say? I believe this. 
since Jesus Christ is God and gave his life for me, I will willingly and gladly give my life to him. It's the only response I can give. And it's the only response he wants. He doesn't ask you for anything else, just your life. He gave his life for you that you could have life. He wants you to follow him. I mentioned earlier there about the hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. It ends. Where the whole realm of nature mine. That were an offering far too small. Love so amazing. So divine. Shall have my soul, my life, my all. That was the response that Isaac Watts gave when he thought about the cross. I don't care if I've got everything in this world, it's not even enough. This amazing love of God has only one response and it's this. It's my life. I want to give him my life. And I believe this morning, I believe there are people here and maybe people even who are listening online and you've been at this point where you've said, you know, I want to respond. I want to cross the line. I want to have this new life that I've been hearing about week in and week out from these people. I, I really want to have a life that's purposeful, meaningful, exciting, satisfying, the kind of life that Jesus promises. I want that life. Or you've been sitting here or, and you've been feeling a stirring or a tugging at your heart and you're, you're saying, I, I've got to do this. I've got to make this move. Maybe even there have been circumstances in your life. I don't know. There have maybe been circumstances in your life, a friend's life, or a family person's life, and they've caused you to think about eternal things deep in your heart. What do you want? You want to be absolutely sure this morning that you're going to heaven. You want to be sure. Well, the good news, the good news for us all is quite simply this. Christ died for us. On the third day, he rose victorious. Today, he's a living, loving, life-changing Savior. And he is seeking for you. Calling you. The good news, good news for you all here this morning is this. If you have not yet Come to Jesus Christ. I assure you, you, you are on God's invitation list. You're on his invitation list. He wants you to come. He's inviting you to come. And you have an opportunity, not just to respond, but now you have an opportunity to receive him. I'm going to ask you, would you do that? Would you receive the Son of God who gave his life for you? And would you give your life to him? That's part of prayer. Now, this morning, you may be a young person. You could be a pensioner like me. Or you could be any age in between or even beyond. No restriction here. This is not an age issue. This invitation is it's open to everyone. But the Bible says, whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Listen to that first word, whoever. That's you. Whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So was. We keep our heads bowed thoughtfully, prayerfully. I'm going to ask you right now, will you come? Will you come? It's a defining moment for you. It's a decision that can change your destiny. 
God can change your life. But you know what? I can't pray the prayer for you. Neither can a friend or a family person. You personally must receive Jesus. And I have put up on the screen a little prayer. It's so simple. It's A, B, and C. Acknowledge, believe, and come. And just now, if you're at that place where you really want this issue to be settled, you want to cross the line, you want to receive Jesus, then travel through the ABC. Jesus, I acknowledge that I have sinned. I need your forgiveness. Be, believe. Just believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He died on the cross for me. You can say that. And come. Jesus, come into my life. Come into my life. I want you. I want you to be my Savior. For a moment or two of quietness, let's just let, let those words, as it were, just strike right in there are very hard. The Son of God says, come. Will you receive him or reject him? Will you say yes or will you say no? Will you come or will you walk away? This is your moment. Come to Jesus. Say this prayer. It's for you. So
please stand. We're going to just sing the. We're going to sing that last verse again, and Rick will come up and close the service. I'm going to ask you one thing about this last verse. You see the last line there. Demands. I don't think God demands anything of us. He's not that person. What about changing demands we shall have? Maybe you've already made your decision in life. Well, say it loudly. Shall have soul my life, my all. You've never made the decision. Declare it this morning. In this moment, Jesus Christ shall have my soul, my life, my own. God bless. Thank you, David. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, our prayer ministry team is going to be here. Service is over. They're going to be at the front. We're going to be at the back. Um, if you have done business with God this morning, um, can I encourage you to come and talk to someone and just let us pray with you and um, let us encourage you? Um, whether that has been that you've realigned your heart with His or that for the very first time you've given your life over to Jesus, please come, and there's people front, people back. Um, also, if there's anything else going on in life that you could just do with some encouragement, and someone drawn alongside and praying for you, then this space is for you. Um, if we, we're heading out, um, maybe just respect that maybe some people are getting prayer ministry, um, and um, we can move out. Once you get through those doors, make as much noise as you want. Um, but if you've heard God's voice speaking to you, please don't ignore it. And please respond. And God, we ask you for your blessing over us. In the strong name of Jesus. Amen.